So we haven't entirely finished discussing the problems. But here is uh, the next one. So we have three prisoners. Here they are. And uh, one of them was randomly selected to be executed. Prisoner in cell number one asks the jailer to give him the name of one of the prisoners, either prisoner two or prisoner three, that will not be executed because it's already known to the to the bailiff or whatever you call it to the uh, to the prisoner to the sorry to the prison guard that is known who among them is executed. So the this guard is saying that he cannot give this information because uh, that information will influence uh, the probability of prisoner one being executed and that would not be any more fair. What do you think? You understand the question? The question is, uh, uh, will the probability of being executed uh, change if the, um, if the prison guard gives this information to prisoner one? So Naomi says it's still, uh, uh, still it's uh, one third, nothing changed. What about the rest of you? What do you think? So Murish, Murshika agrees uh, with Naomi. She says, there is no, not gonna be any difference, right? So uh, this information is not going to affect the probability that a uh, prisoner in cell one is executed. Also, you have to be very careful. Think about uh, what do we mean by this probability? What is it that we are, uh, we are trying to calculate?
So Shotaro thinks uh, the probability might be increased to one half once this information is known. Assuming jailer tells him, so that's uh, Alejandro agrees with uh, Shotaro here. Interesting. What about the rest of you guys? You understood the question, right? So one was chosen by lot randomly, that's known, and it will be executed. Prisoner number one, the brainy guy, he wants to uh, know which of the other two will be spared. And the, and the prison guard is not wanting to give him this information on the claim that it will increase the odds of prisoner one being executed and therefore making it uh, you know, more likely. He doesn't want to give him this information. So it's quiet rainy day. Are you thinking guys, uh, or you have fallen asleep? It's hard for me to know. So do you want the answer revealed? Uh, my answer to be precise revealed, or do you want to think about it a little longer? That was not a probability question. So come on guys, uh, you are here in this class. You're not just, uh, you have not just to uh, have what, 15 people that logged in. That, that means that 15 people are actually here, not just uh, logged in and left, yes? And uh, I do notice, of course, some people that do not come to the lectures. I noticed that. Good, okay. Reveal it, Erika Junk says. And you, Stephen, Stephen R, what do you say? Reveal it, are you here? Okay, thank you, Stephen. Yes, and who else is here? Melissa, what do you want? Okay, Melissa says one third. Interesting. So in other words, doesn't change my smart little little fellows. Okay, so let's uh, consider uh, what happens here. My answer is uh, slightly different from all of you, right? But and here is uh, what I would say. Okay, so let EI be the event that prisoner number I is the one executed. And then the probability of that without any other information is one third. So what do I mean by that one third, guys? I mean that, um, you see, if I know nothing about this universe and I uh, simulate the situation again and again and again, I will find that, let's say out of, um, out of uh, 3 million simulations, exactly uh, 1 million, or not exactly, but roughly 1 million will be, uh, will, be, will be prisoner one, 1 million will be prisoner two, 1 million will be prisoner three, good? And uh, now when, when I say let, uh, let's consider the universes in which jailer names prisoner two as the one pardoned, okay? You understand? So I'm ignoring all possible universes where something else happens, but let's consider what happens if uh, prisoner two is uh, named as pardoned, right? So I'm only considering, uh, I'm only considering uh, those universes and how many of them is prisoner one uh, executed, good? So I'm interested in uh, probability that prisoner one is executed given uh, the information that say that prisoner two is pardoned, yes? You understand, so can, you can imagine what happens here, right? So you have all those multiple universes where, uh, where you don't have any information right now. You don't see what it might, it might be, right? But uh, there might be prisoner one pardon, prisoner two, uh, sorry, prisoner two pardon or prisoner three pardon. And I'm now ignoring all the universes in which prisoner 
uh, three was pardoned, right? And I'm just considering universes where prisoner two was pardoned. And then I, I uh, use the usual um, Bayesian um, expansion, yes? So you understand, I don't need to explain it again. You're pretty good at it. I can cross away uh, probability E1, E2, and E3 because they are the same, right? So it's really probability that uh, uh, prisoner two is named as pardoned given prisoner one is executed uh, and, uh, and then prisoner the same thing. And then uh, probability that prisoner two is named as pardoned given that he is executed and probability that prisoner two is pardoned given three is executed, yes? So here we can see that, uh, um, let's, let's consider that this probability that th this, this person is named, prisoner number two is named, is probability uh, P. I don't know it because here you have a choice, right? You have a choice whether it will be prisoner, uh, prisoner, if prisoner one is executed, I, uh, the, 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 uh, the guard has a choice between prisoner two and prisoner three, which to name. And let's say he will name uh, prisoner two with probability P. Uh, here there is no choice, right? Because it cannot, it cannot be, it cannot be named. Prisoner two cannot be named if he is the one executed. And uh, if prisoner three is executed, there is also no, cho no choice. I ha he has to name prisoner two. So it's P over P plus one. That's the general situation. Now, when the jailer has no bias, in other words, the, when the jailer has a choice between prisoner, prisoner two and prisoner three, he will randomly select which one of them. That P is one half. You understand? If there is no bias, right? But uh, so it's one half over one half plus one. And if you multiply that by two, the answer will be one third. But uh, you understand that uh, P could be something else, right? When there is a choice, uh, when there is a choice, um, P here could be, um, how do you say that? So, uh, so I think, I think basically that if there is a bias, it can influence, uh, this information actually can influence, uh, the probability. That's what I'm saying, right? So if there is no bias. You're all correct. But if there is a bias, what I mean by influence probability, obviously, uh, obviously they're, they're understated if you just simulate it without, uh, without actual, actual, actually seeing the information, and then the probability is uh, going to be one third, as you said, it's already happened. What, I, what we're calculating here is the universes in which prisoner two is named. You understand? So out of those universes, uh, is, there, uh, is the chances the same? You understand? So for example, uh, you know, in, the, in the universes where somehow prisoner one is the one named uh, to be executed, right? And then you know, when, if, you're, if, you're, if you're told you are actually be going to be executed, you know that you're in the universe uh, where it's already gonna happen, right? Before you were named, it might, uh, you might have been in all sorts of universes. Once you are told that you are executed, you now know with 100% certainty that it's you. You understand? So it's a restricted type of uh, universe. It's already, it's in other words, like looking at the outcome. Now, when you look at the second guy, it's also somewhat like looking at the outcome. Yes? Uh, okay, so I hope you understood uh, my take on it, right? So if there is no bias, then it's one third, as you said, but if there is a bias, then uh, the fact that I know that prisoner, once I know the information and I know, say, no, it's prisoner two, uh, then uh, then uh, I, I might see that, for example, I might see that there is, uh, that there is, that's not, the answer is not one third. So here is another, this is the classical Monty Hall. This one, you, I'm sure you know. Price, they're all the same, right? Price is behind one of three curtains. Contestant picks a curtain and then host of show opens one of the two remaining curtains where the prize isn't found. What should the contestant do? You understand? So you pick one of the curtains. Uh, the prize was re initially randomly placed behind one of them. The others contain uh, no prize. So you pick a curtain and then the host of the show unveils it. You see that it's really similar to the prisoner thing, right? And now the question is, uh, uh, what should you do? Should you stay with your choice or should you switch?
I forgot to write it explicitly, but I think you, you know this game, right? So uh, let's say you pick curtain number one and curtain number three is open and there is no price behind it. Should you switch or should you remain? And why should you switch if you say that you should switch? Maybe you shouldn't switch, who knows? <laughs> yeah, good. It's funny. How much higher? So uh, if you switch, then what is it? Calculate, guys. It's very famous. Uh, many of you have heard it, of course, before. Thank you, Erica. That's good. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Alejandro. Pretty good analysis and pretty difficult to write it, I suppose, uh, like this in text. They also, the question is also, is there necessarily kind of this best strategy? Maybe there's a better strategy than switching. In other words, switch when, you know, something happens and not switch when something doesn't happen. Good. 
So guys, uh, should I reveal the answer? There are still a few people that are uh, here quiet and I do not know. Are you thinking about it? It's hard to judge if you're in suspense or, or bored to death. So let's do it, yes? Ready? So um, here is how I, uh, I solved it. I say, let's suppose that WS is the event contestant wins by switching, okay? So, I mean, clearly there is no loss of generality. We can imagine we selected curtain number one, yes? So uh, then what will happen? Once, uh, uh, so the switching will, will be, will be uh, to the other curtain that, were the, uh, that was not open, right? So then what can happen? Either, uh, so, uh, so, so I switch, but the price is behind curtain number one, times the probability price in, is in curtain number one, plus I switch and the price is behind curtain number two, right? Times the probability of that, or when I switch and the price is behind curtain number three. So let's see. Clearly, I will uh, lose in the first case, right? If, I, if the price is behind curtain number one, I switch, I lost. So this is zero, as Alejandro said, zero, right? And then uh, the second part, if the price is behind curtain number two, there was no choice. The host of the show had to open curtain number three. And so I'm switching to the price. And then I win with probability one in that case, yes? Plus, um, if the price were behind curtain number three, there was no choice, yes? And so I will win again. So I win two thirds of the time if I use the strategy. Whereas if I stay, I can use the same, uh, the same type of analogy. I, you can say uh, probability of winning by holding, W sub H, probability of winning where you hold your choice. And then uh, you only win one third of the times. Yeah, that they are mutually exclusive strategies or you can just do the same analogy, right? So that, in other words, it will be zero everywhere except for the first uh, part. It will be one in the very first part, okay? But uh, in particular circumstances, perhaps, for example, you know something about the host and maybe uh, the host is communicating to you where the price is located, right? For example, imagine that you paid the host uh, $10 or I'm not sure what, what amount of money you should pay the host. And uh, he agreed to, um, to, to do the following, right? It, it, to say that if there is a choice between curtain number two and curtain number three, if there is a choice, he will open curtain number three. You understand? So then there is this ambiguity. Is he communicating information or is he just uh, opening the curtain three because there is no choice? You understand it's, it's a bit artificial, but in that, in this particular instance, when you see that, if you have this agreement, uh, then that particular instance, the probability of switching is one half because you cannot tell whether he's uh, communicating something to you. That the, in other words, you understand in, indirectly trying to tell you that uh, the price is behind curtain number one, you see, by opening curtain number three, or he had no choice and had to open uh, curtain number three. So uh, the strat this is still true. If you use the strategy, you win two thirds of the time. But in particular instances, you might, uh, you might think that your odds are 50-50. Are Good? You understand what I'm talking about, right? So it's, it's just, uh, you're just, just trying to think about it. So this one is, um, is a very, very nice problem, the next one. I, ho I hope you will be very interested in it. So it was relayed to me through the book, The Grapes of Math via a very helpful dwarf. Yes, uh, it is, it, the message is of course a code to somebody. Okay, so uh, here, is the, uh, here is the game. Write any two distinct numbers. They can be real numbers, let's say like pi and root of two. There is no restriction. Any two real numbers whatsoever, they just cannot be the same number. You understand? You cannot write pi and pi or root and two root of two and root of two again. You write them on two separate sheets of paper. Yes? And uh, then the question is as follows, right? So um, uh, I will pick one of the sheets. You know, you turn, them, you turn the sheets upside down. I will pick one of the sheets and I will look at the number that you wrote, one of them. And then I will I will try to guess without looking at the second number, which of the two is bigger. You understand? 
I cannot, I'm not gonna try to guess uh, uh, which number is which. I'm not gonna tell you what number you wrote, but I'm going to guess which of those two numbers are bigger, the one that I looked at or the one that I haven't seen. Good? The question is, and then we're gonna bet. If I can get, if I can correctly answer this question, if I can say, well, what I'm holding is the biggest one or the one that is that I cannot see is the biggest number. Um, and then I win a dollar. And if I cannot do it, if I'm mistaken, then I lose a dollar to you. Who has advantage in this game, me or you? Or maybe you can say there is no advantage, you understand? That's the question. Is there an advantage to anyone here? Is it pure chance? Or do, does one of us have an advantage? That's the question. Interesting, huh? Are you ready? Or it, it would be, it's something that you can try to think about, but uh, I don't think you will come up with the, the answer to it. The answer is that I have the advantage. You know, here is how I'm going to do it. I would have not think, thought of it either, I think, you know, uh, pretty weird. Uh, so here is what my, my strategy will be. I will uh, generate a random number. Maybe I'll use the normal distribution. The random number should be any real number, right? I will just generate it using a normal distribution or any other distribution capable of generating uh, all numbers whatsoever. And I look at the number, yes? And uh, let's say that this number that I generated is the number K. If the number K is smaller than the number I observed, I will stick with my choice. I'll say the number I observed is the biggest. If the number K is smaller, is bigger, sorry, than the number I observed, I switch. You understand? So uh, I use the number K as, um, as a substitute for the second number that I'm not uh, visualizing, that I'm not seeing. Are you with me? You understand? So I actually see one of the numbers that you, uh, you drew on the piece of paper. You can say randomly, doesn't matter, right? I randomly picked one of those pieces of paper and I observed the number on it that you wrote. I know one number. I don't know the second number, but I substitute it with this randomly generated number K. I pretend that the other number is that uh, number K that, that uh, I generated. And if that number K is smaller, then of course I stick with my choice. And if it is bigger, I switch. Good. Now uh, let's understand why that will work. Okay, that will give me an advantage and it depends on how you play this game and what sort of distribution I selected. Uh, I might have a huge advantage or I might have a very little advantage. Yes, but I will always have an advantage ever so slight. Uh, so here is uh, how that's supposed to work. Okay, so you see, uh, it, because it's a real number, it's impossible that the number K is exactly equal to any of the two numbers on the piece of paper. It's impossible, believe me, right? So the only possibilities are that, uh, that the number K is either smaller than both numbers or between both numbers. So A is smaller than both, B is between, C is bigger than uh, the numbers, than all the, both numbers, make sense? And so the probability of winning using my strategy is the probability uh, given A plus the probability given B and the probability given C. Are you with me? Yes. So I do not know those probabilities because uh, it's complicated, right? Uh, we're just using them abstractly. There is some probability that I generated a number a PA smaller than both, uh, the probability that I generated a number between both and the probability I generated a number bigger than both, okay? So the probability that I win given that uh, I selected the number um, K smaller than both is uh, one half because you see, I mean, um, smaller than both, I'm, go I'm getting no information. Either, uh, either, I chose, um, I, either I chose the biggest number or I got uh, the other number, no information whatsoever, right? Because it's below both numbers if that happens, right? I do not know if I'm holding bigger number or smaller number, okay? 
uh, the probability uh, similarly, if, if, if the number uh, that I generated, the number K is bigger than both, it's also not, not giving me any advantage. But where, when it does give me an advantage is in between. Because if I know that, uh, that we selected the number in between, then if I see that this number is bigger, then I'm holding the smaller, in, the smaller of the numbers, right? In other words, the numbers are X and Y, right? If uh, K was generated in between, if I know that, right? That's the given thing, uh, winning given that it's in between. If I generated K in between X and Y, then, uh, uh, then let's say one situation is that I observe that Y is bigger than K. If it's in between, obviously, then Y is bigger than X, you understand? Then I stick with my choice. If I see that K is bigger in, in the situation where it's in between, uh, then I obviously selected the smaller of the two numbers and then I switch. And then, there, then I win, you see? If I generated a number in between them, I, my strategy generates victory all the time for the particular situation where K is in between. It sometimes will be in between, sometimes uh, outside, right? For outside, it doesn't help. In between, it helps. And here is what happens here, right? So the probability of winning, is then one half times the probability the number generated below both times the probability of, uh, uh, of, uh, of winning if the number is, is in between, it's one, and that's the probability that the number will be in between, plus one half times the probability the number is outside. So if I now factor it, probability A, B, C is equal to one. This is equal to one. And here I can factor one half B. So it's really one half times one plus probability of B, which is bigger than one half. So my probability of winning is bigger than one half. I cannot calculate exactly uh, how bigger. Uh, it depends on the numbers you select, but it's bigger. If you select the two numbers very close together, I have less advantage. If, you, if I use the normal distribution and you select the numbers close to zero, let's say one number you selected is negative, one is positive, or close to zero and one is far from the other, I will win almost always. You understand? Isn't it interesting? Yeah. Good. So now we talk about the last topic of chapter three, independence. All right, independent events. So generally when event F occurs, F modifies the likelihood of another event E. Agreed? So when, some, when you get some information, there is a modification of the likelihood, of the probability. Uh, and uh, that means that probability of E given that F occurred is not the same as probability of E occurring. Now you have to remember that every single thing that ever happens makes, uh, uh, reduces the number of potential universes that you might be observing and therefore may have an effect on the probability. Um, so if it happens that the probability of E given F is the same as the unrestricted probability of E, we call E an independent ev event from F. E is independent uh, from F. And you, you understand what that means. When F occurs, uh, the number of possible universes is reduced. And proportionately, the number of universes with uh, the desired outcome is reduced. You understand? So for example, if I had uh, six universes originally and three of them had the desired property, maybe F occurred and now I have um, two universes and one with desired property. Probability hasn't changed, okay? Even though the set of possibilities has shrunk, they have shrunk proportionately, good? So make sure that you understand it's not, it's not like I toss away F. It's not like it's unimportant, but it's just the probability is not registering this uh, difference. So probability of E given F is equal to probability of E. That means that, um, that E is independent of F. Good. Now, we can use uh, this um, Bayesian formula is that uh, probability of E given F is probability E intersect F divided by probability F and that equals to probability of E if it's independent, yes? So unless any of them is zero, that means that probability of E and F is probability of E times probability of F. In other words, I can multiply them which was also clear, I suppose, from the multiplication rule, right? What is that? This is the probability of F times probability E given F, which I can delete the given F and just replace it by probability E. You see that? It's like the multiplication rule that you were using in general, but you no longer have to specify that E depends on F here in, in this place, right? It's like multiplication rule written, in, written from right to left. 
before I continue, so far everything clear? Uh, confirm, guys, so that I'm not skipping anything. You understand the multiplication rule and what I'm talking about? Okay, more. Come on, guys. Come on. You can even press Y if you don't want to write uh, too many things, too many letters. Good. Beautiful. So here is a, here are a few basic observations. A few basic observations is that um, is that suppose that um, that we know that probability of E given F is probability E. In other words, E is independent of F. It happens that F is also independent of E. You understand? So in, in, in the first uh, case, we're assuming that F has happened. Some, some universe of property F has uh, come into existence. We want uh, the potential for universes of type E. The probability, uh, if, if, if the probability has not changed, it's just the probability of universes of type E, then we will observe that the probability of F given E is the same as the un unqualified probability, they, they call it uh, the prior probability of F. So far clear? Why is that the case? Here, here is the calculation, look at it. Probability of F given E is probability of EF divided by probability E. Now the numerator I can write as probability E multiplied by probability F divided by probability E, which I can then cross out and I get probability F. You see that? So I can verify that algebraically, you can think of um, other intuitive ways. I, in, in one of the office hours, I was drawing pictures and you can of course find uh, some nice animations by three blue, one brown. And I think uh, a few others. Uh, Veritasium had made some video about uh, Bayesian statistics. I, I imagine it was a good video. He makes pretty good videos. I don't remember what it was about. Okay, so the, here is another observation. If E and F are independent, then so is E and F complement. Don't be so sad, Valeria. Everything's going to be fine. So why is that uh, the situation? Look at it, you understand what I'm saying? If E is independent from F, then E is also independent of F co uh, complement. In other words, F does not give information, then F complement also does not give information about the probability. Not about universes, but about probability. That's because probability of E intersect F complement is the same, if you remember, as probability E minus probability of E intersect F. Yes? You see that, guys? And uh, what's this term? This term is by, by our assumption of independence is just the product of probability E and probability F. Right, so here it is. And here I can factor out probability E and then I can write one minus probability F is just probability F complement. Here calculation cal uh, complete. Good. You can think of uh, pictures or intuitive explanations if you want to. Okay, here's, a, here's an example. So very important. I, I hope you understand independence. We'll check it at the end of this uh, lecture, whether you understand it really. And two fair dice are tossed. Let E, e sub one be that uh, sum is equal to six. That's the event. And E two is sum equal to seven. And F is first die is four. So here is the first question. Is E one independent of F. Is E1 independent of F? You understand? If I know that F occurred, for example, will it influence the probability of E1? Right? If I know that first die uh, happened to be four, does it affect my uh, estimate of what happens, uh, um, what, what happens to the sum equal to six? How likely is that? Okay, great. Yes. Now, how do you see that it's yes, right? You see that it's yes very simply. Um, probability of E1 unrestricted, it's five out of 36, you agree? So it's, it's uh, just E1 means uh, sum is six. So it means one and five all the way to five and one, right? So it's five possibilities. And uh, E1 given F, so if I know that first one, uh, first die came to be, 
you see, it's like it's like it's like already a partially complete uh, Kafka document, Kafka protocol, right? So uh, the space for die one is filled with the number four, if f occurred, right? So I only have six possibilities for the remaining die, and only one of those possibilities, namely, I have to put in one, will correspond to an outcome of six. So so five over thirty six is not the same as one over six. This is smaller, right? So the fact that I got a four makes it uh, more likely uh, that uh, I actually have um, uh, that I actually have a sum of six if I get four. You see, it's more likely. This had to, if, this, if you add one, it would be one over six. So this one is smaller. Makes uh, it more likely that sum is six. Good? Understood, yes. So, uh, and then uh, what about E2? E2 is that where the sum is equal to seven, remember? So if I observe, for example, that first die is a four, does it affect the probability that sum is equal to seven? It is independent. Thank you, Naomi. And what about the rest of you? What do you think? Uh, especially, guys, it's not only this question. I want you to always actively imagine uh, the situation. Yes? Thank you, Abhishek. Always actively imagine the situation. What has happened here? I have, uh, in my Kafka protocol, I have two boxes. Yes? So I want to know what's the likelihood that sum is equal to seven. In general, there are six possibilities to fill in this box to create sum equal to seven. Do you agree? It's either one and six all the way to six and one. So those boxes have six uh, different ways of filling them out to produce sum equal to seven. And uh, unrestricted uh, to sum equal to seven, there are, uh, there are 36 ways. So it's six out of 36, right? It's, not a, it's, it's the same number, but not the same as one over six. Now, you see what happens, guys. If I, in the first box, I place that uh, the output was four, there is only one possibility for the second box to produce a seven, but altogether six possibilities, right? So it's, uh, so it, it, with, with the partial information that we have F, that we have that um, first die is four, I have six universes in total that, uh, that are possible and only one of them gives me one over seven. You understand? So that's what happened. And information actually affected the possible universes but proportionally cut uh, the 36 universes by six and the six universes with the desired property where sum is equal to seven to one. You understand why, why, what happened here, right? So it's not that the information was meaningless. It's that the information proportionately cut numerator and denominator by the same factor by one over six. Okay, so again, guys, when you, see, when, you when you think about six over 36, conceptually, it's not exactly the same as one over six in combinatorics. You understand what I mean? Wonderful. Okay, now, now the hard question. Are you ready for the hard question? I hope you like it. Okay, so suppose that E is independent from some event n and e is independent from some event t abstractly right so i find that uh, information n does not affect probability of e and information t does not affect probability of e if both n and t happened does it affect the probability you understand so event n does if it happened does not affect the likelihood of e Event T when it happens does not affect the likelihood of E. Will 
the intersection of N and T, if both happen, will that affect the likelihood of E? By the way, did I mention this is what I'm reading, right? So you can join it if you want. Valeria says yes, Sofia says yes. Thank you, Valeria, and thank you, Sofia. What about the rest of you? Naomi says, yes. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, it's, it's nice that I teach you so well. Paula says, yes, independent. Yes, yes means independent, correct? We're Americans, we, we, we are going to vote. Independence is important to us, yes? Come on, guys, uh, what about the rest of you? I'm sorry if I hurry you. I, I do want you to think about it thoroughly. Sandy says independent. Okay. Melissa says independent. Great, right? Independent. So, so nice. And what about the rest of you? Khan says it's independent. My God, it's so nice we have consensus. Right, in other words, uh, if, uh, if N does not give information about E and T does not give information about E, then why should the intersection give any information? Yes, kind of like that. Let's see. Oh, so uh, uh, let's see. So who, who are, uh, more people have answered than I realized. Uh, so everybody says it's independent. Am I right? 
So Naomi says, then Abhishek says yes, Shotaro says yes, uh, Sofia says yes, yes, lots of people say yes. And Elisa, yes? I, 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 did I miss anybody? Did Alejandro say yes? Did Paulina say yes? Did, let's say what's, uh, see, what did they, let me see. Uh, Khan, Paulina said yes, Naomi said yes, Valeria said yes, Sofia, Shotaro, Abhishek, Okay. Are you ready, guys? Allow me to show you my true nature. Do you see it? Do you see the picture? What do you see in the picture? Yeah, let, me, let me show you again. It's a little small, I'm sorry. It should have been a bigger picture. I, I should try to make it larger. I think it's Little Red Riding Hood. Oh, good. You remember the story. Let's see if you remember the story well enough. Krasnaya Shapochka, that's much better. There is a parrot, actually. I should send you a video, or maybe after it. I send you a video. It tells uh, the story of Little Red Riding Hood very well. Ya Krasnaya Shapochka, tuk, tuk, tuk. Tam. All right, so let me tell you the story. Little Red Riding Hood meets several animals on her way to grandma from the forest. Nine animals to be exact. Six of the animals have big eyes. Three of them have long noses and three of them have sharp teeth. Having taken my probability class, she draws the following diagram. Here are the animals that have big eyes. Here are the animals that have long noses. And here are the animals that have sharp teeth. She then wonders, what is the probability that he has big eyes given that he has a long nose to sniff me? So that's probability of E given N. That probability you can see from this diagram, given N there are only three possibilities, right? Only three animals have big noses and two of them have big eyes, right? So that probability is two thirds. But what is the probability of having big eyes out of all the animals? It's six divided by nine, which is two thirds. You agree? Six out of nine, I, I drew this diagram, yes? So we can conclude that um, having big eyes is independent of a big nose, yes? Good. Whew, we are not that, uh, not that much in danger. What about um, having big eyes and sharp teeth? Mm, again, right? Exactly three animals have sharp teeth and only two of them have big eyes. So the probability of big eyes given sharp teeth is two thirds. Great, right? Two thirds. Uh, we 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 so it did not get more dangerous just yet. But what about the probability of big eyes given sharp teeth and long nose? Long nose, sharp teeth, right? Intersection is one. Probability of having big eyes is then one. Yes, and here you go. You did not escape the wolf. None of you who answered it escaped the wolf. I'm gonna eat you. You understood what I just explained, guys? So no, given that uh, two e is independent of each event separately, E is not at all necessarily independent from the intersection. Do you understand that? Now, what, uh, what made it uh, here? I'm not sure what went uh, when you were thinking about it. Again, I'm telling you guys, uh, this is not surprising if you don't throw this information away. You understand? It, when something happens, it's not that the information is useless or unimportant. It's just that this information cuts the probability well, it cuts the uh, universes of desired probability 
sorry, my apologies. I said, hey, I, I, I cannot stop saying probability. It's like a parasitic word now, right? So here, look at E guys, right? The full universe of my space has nine universes, nine outcomes, right? I, I, she, I, might, I might be eaten by, or not me, you will be eaten by one of three animals, right? One of nine animals, sorry, right? So uh, then we have how many of those animals have big eyes? Six of them, right? So probability of uh, meeting an animal with big eyes is six, six universes, six animals that you meet out of nine. Now, if I uh, verify that the animal has big nose, my universe, my, I no longer have S, I now have N, N is my outcome. You see what happened? This is my much uh, more limited set of universes. So I then, if I met an animal with a big nose, I either met this animal, which does not have big eyes, or this animal, which does have big eyes, and this animal, which does have big eyes. You see what happened? The set of animals shrunk, but the set of animals within it that have big eyes shrunk by proportion, the same way, right? Look at it, what happened? Uh, the uh, set of, uh, my, my universe has shrunk by a factor of three, you see? I now have uh, one third of the universe is possible, but uh, the possible universes have also shrunk, the possible universes of desired property have also shrunk by the same factor, by a factor of three. So probability hasn't changed, yes? You understand? So, but event N very much affected the possibilities of my universes, right? I, I, it limited uh, quite a few universes that are impossible. T similarly limited, but, but it kept proportion. You understand? Probability is just keeping proportion. But together, why should they keep proportion? You understand? When you think about keeping proportion together, they don't have to keep proportion, as this picture clearly shows. So independence, again, it's not that information is irrelevant. Never think this way. Information is always relevant. Sometimes it just does not affect probability because it cuts possible potential universes by the same proportion as potential universes of desired quality. Am I making sense? Good. Here is what independence of, let's say, three events mean, right? So for three events to be independent, it must be that probability of the intersection is the product of probabilities. The probability of any pairs in intersected is the product of the probabilities, you see? So independence, uh, you, can, you can kind of try to play around with it. It's actually very difficult to test once you have more than two events. It becomes complicated, right? So uh, this is what independence is when, uh, uh, when, when I have three events. And if I have four events, there are going to be more formulas, right? So that any interaction between them is not affecting probabilities. Okay, make sense? If those uh, situations are true, then uh, we have independent events. There's much more to say about independent events, but I think we, we will have to go to chapter four and uh, talk about uh, all sorts of other things. Good? So it's too bad. I, mean, I wish I had a, a one more page. I don't want to begin chapter four today since, uh, you know, there are only 10 minutes. What can I do with 10 minutes? So would you like to, uh, what would you like to do? How many exam questions have you already been able to solve anymore? Or, yeah? If you, if you are worried by something, again, guys, two things, right? I just, if, if you end up, if I, if I suspect that you uh, are cheating, it just upsets me because I worked very hard for this not to happen, right? And for you to understand the material. So it upsets me and I become paranoid easily when, when I begin. And when I grade those things, I, I wonder, well, that's very good sometimes. I think, is it, is it good because I have such wonderful students or is it too good? So if you, are, if you are bothered by anything, if you're worried by something, just talk to me, I will help you, okay? But if you go around my back, I will feel uh, upset. And then who knows what I will do. I don't want to be enemies. Good. Okay, so uh, let's stop this uh, uh, lecture. And if you want to talk about uh, uh, previous exams or anything like that, we, uh, we can do that.